Khan for inviting me to participate uh, and share a uh, part of, and hopefully give you some insight on uh, my research and my process in making the work for uh, Mural Remix. Um, so uh, actually my, I think this project began even before I was invited and uh, it began through a friendship with a, a, a neighbor named Nancy Tovar uh, who lived in Lincoln Heights and uh, was, was, uh, was the kind of so, sort of a grandmother to the boyfriend of, of a real good friend of, of mine. And um, she uh, had the best, the, the best cactus garden in Lincoln Heights. Uh, uh, this is a, a still from a previous project I did, an animated photo novella called Taco de Sesos, and this was shot in front of her house. Um, but she was putting together a slideshow for the opening of, of a new community art center in Boyle Heights, uh, First Street Studios, and uh, was uh, pulling out uh, boxes of, of slides of murals uh, she had taken in the 1970s. Uh, she asked me to go over to show her how to use her scanner. So uh, went over and um, uh, showed her how to use her scanner, and as, as I was sifting through these boxes, I was just amazed uh, by all these murals. Um, some of them were, were familiar. I grew up in LA. I, I had already taught Chicano art for a number of years. I read a lot of discourse. But in scanning through her, her uh, boxes, there was just like dozens and dozens and dozens of murals that I had never seen. And also, I, I began to seek aesthetic styles that uh, uh, really interested me. So, um, um, in when I was actually invited to uh, participate in this project, uh, I was given a lot of space leeway in terms of choosing what I focused on. Chose to focus on murals for a, a number of, of reasons. Uh, um, really kind of mostly just strategic. One, uh, being very aware that there's a mural moratorium in, in the city, uh, the criminalization of, of street artists in, in the 90s and at, at the present, uh, the literal erasure of many of these uh, murals as the kind of city uh, went out and began kind of buffing a lot of murals that, that were tagged. Um, but with, when I began the project, my initial impulse wasn't necessarily to go out and find everything I could find on muralism, but really to uh, just begin to sit with this archive and, and begin to read the archive. Uh, this is a slide from one panel of, of a larger uh, string of, of murals on the wall of a, of a freeway in Lincoln Heights that was painted in the city. So it was a project, a mural project uh, organized by Judy Baca called Las Vista Nuevas, um, in which there were a number of mural directors and, and dozens and dozens of, of, of youth uh, volunteers. Um, I think in scanning through uh, Tovar's uh, archive of slide images, uh, um, on one level, uh, the murals that I stumbled upon were, were familiar. I was very kind of familiar with the, the, the type of political iconography, the images of the revolutionary heroes, uh, the images uh, that had to deal with Chicano identity. Uh, those had been pretty well documented and written about in existing history. Um, the murals that had uh, approached approach uh, and used a social realist style. But I was really kind of drawn, uh, as I was sifting through those, those boxes of slides, I was really or drawn to the murals that fell outside of that frame. Um, I think uh, in actually looking at what was actually produced there, I realized that those like overtly kind of political uh, murals, uh, identity-based murals, really kind of represented a, a small portion of what was actually painted. And I, I, I came to the awareness that actually the archive was really vast and, and it kind of on a certain level defied the discourse. So um, 
So what really kind of intrigued me was, you know, so I was drawn to, as you see on the bottom of this, like uh, these these landscapes of the, the, the 70s uh, graphic style. So my challenge really kind of was in this project was to find a language uh, to create a frame in which to look at that work. Um, again, I was familiar with the the revolutionary Chicano activist with the fist in the uh, in the air, but uh, uh, not. I was also aware that not much had been written about the the bohemian hippie poet fiction figure. Uh, so that influence of the counterculture really kind of be, was one of the first questions I formed and began to explore. Uh, this is a, a mural uh, actually painted by my brother. Um, he painted this after coming back uh, from uh, cycling in Europe with no money, selling trips. Uh, in Mexico and Europe for a couple of years and coming back an artist. So I remember, I actually remember the day he walked in. I was probably five or six and uh, we hadn't heard from him for a year and uh, my sister was on the phone and she screamed and uh, in walked in this like crazy character, <laughs> thin as a rail with like hair to, to his waist. He looked like he came out of the mountains. I uh, was like, Ernesto! And through that trip, he was completely uh, transformed and um, I began to paint murals. Um, and this is one of the first murals that he painted. Uh, this was at uh, Strata Courts. Uh, in a row of murals, uh, in a row uh, of buildings uh, that had nature themed. Uh, uh, it had nature themes in a strata courts called Nature Row. Um, you know, in, in talking to some some of the artists, like the the, the the artists whose work wasn't overtly political, they talked about being criticized because they weren't uh, doing political work. Um, but I think, like, in in, in, in thinking. And inheriting kind of the legacy of what began in the 70s, I also kind of was very aware, but maybe, maybe it didn't have a, a, a politic that we're familiar with, but there was another politic embedded in this type of work. And so kind of part of my challenge was to begin to name that other politic or those other other uh, political readings of, of that work. So I began thinking about the landscape. Um, Here's an image of an aerial view of Estrada Quartz. Uh, um, and Estrada Quartz was built in, in the 1940s during World War II uh, during a labor shortage. Uh, LA really boomed uh, in the war uh, manufacturing economy. Um, and it was, and uh, the Architectural plans were directly drawn from architectural uh, plans used to create housing from military barracks in the, the 19, uh, during the same era. Um, so I wanted to, in, those, in looking at those uh, landscape murals, I wanted to understand them in relation, I began to think about them in relationship to the larger urban landscape in relationship to of the post-war manufacturing uh, economy and in relationship to housing built for, for workers and laborers at that time. Uh, uh, I began to read uh, Henry Le Fay, uh, my uh, good friend David Diaz uh, introduced me to him and really kind of wanted to, to read, begin to read those uh, landscape murals through an urbanist lens. I think uh, LeFay's work really helped me understand how power, think about the landscape as, as something that reflected uh, the needs of, of capitalist society, that urban, the, the Southern California landscape was indeed space shaped and designed for those economic needs and reflected them. Um, within my work, I, I think also I've always been kind of really interested in uh, agency, our ability to become actors. Um, this, um, at Estrada Courts, uh, 
a number of uh, the early murals kind of began with uh, the mural organizers, uh, Felix and Norma Montoya, working with youth and just painting these kind of abstract, kind of Aztec-inspired geometric uh, designs on walls. Um, I was really interested in how, through the use of paint and the use of the mural form, how that could be a strategy to claim space, to transform the architecture designed by power, um, um, and how through that the paint, uh, literally artists were transforming their environment, transforming through their communities to something designed for them, but it's designed by, transforming their communities into something designed by them. Here's another still from Estrada Parks. So actually when I began my field research, I had, my field research uh, really kind of was guided by these, these questions that I had already formulated. <laughs> Um, here's a, a mural painted uh, by an artist named Norma Montoya, who was a key organizer at the store, uh, course, and also had never really been recognized as, uh, or mentioned in the literature I found on Estrada Courts as, as an organizer. Um, this is a, a mural called Dream World. Uh, um, not Sleeping Woman's Dream, actually it's labeled on another website says Sleeping Woman's Dream, but I I finally figured out that the, her, the real, real title was three year old. Um, um, in, one thing that also surfaced as I, I began to look through uh, Tovar's archive was I began to start to identify uh, uh, certain aesthetics, recurring aesthetics within some of the work. And one thing that really struck me was this kind of flat, graphic, kind of 70s style. Um, when I interviewed uh, artists, a number of them uh, talked about going to community colleges and taking uh, uh, classes in commercial art and uh, um, being influenced by super graphic style. Oops, and I'm going super slow saying that. Speed up. So, so one thing I tried to do was flesh that out. Another thing I was really interested in was the psychedelic influences, the psychedelic iconography within the work. Um, so I think within the show I really kind of to, tried to create a frame that looked at the mural through a spatial language. Uh, the space, urban space, uh, uh, space as in terms of psychedelia, You'll see that uh, in a number of the murals I sample. This is uh, Road to the Cosmic Spirit, uh, painted at uh, uh, Ramona Gardens by uh, Ismael Smiley Casares. But when I began to look at the, the psychedelic uh, influenced murals, I also began to ask what, what, so what does that mean? What happens when it gets filtered through uh, a child's lens? And uh, I think one, one writer I can continually refer to is Edward Said's work, and uh, in his writing on culture, he reminds me of the importance of imagination in liberation struggles. Um, so I began to look at the mural as a space to, to create new myths, to create new cosmologies, to create new visions, um, and to begin to defy what is known, what is established. Um, and uh, within the show, I kind of argue that there is this kind of Chicano decolonial sample sensibility. Uh, where the mural becomes a space to, a mind-altering space to create visions of a decolonized self. The other, uh, the other way I use space as a, as a metaphor is, is looking at the mural as, a, as a, a place where a social space is created. So here's uh, something from the Spark Archives. Uh, um, when uh, I interviewed uh, artist Judith Hernandez, um, 
and asked her to to uh, if she could give me a, a story of, of a specific instance in which the process of creating mural really activated the people she worked with. And she came up. She she uh, told this incredible story about this one experience painting mural at Stoner Park LA, um, in which. Uh, when she was working with youth, uh, um, the police were really kind of unhappy about the project. And at one point, one cop came in and uh, went to the office, walked out, and picked up one kid uh, by a shirt and lifted it to him, his face, who was painting a mural. Uh, within 30 seconds, a minute later, seven, seven cop cars uh, drove in, and um, it created this riot situation. Uh, so I began to think, why was the mural so threatening? Um, and it was because it was a space to, to imagine a new self, uh, to act outside the social rules allotted to us. And actually, I'm going to wind up because I'm over time. Um, a lot of things did make it into the archive. Uh, I found this at the Spark Archives. Uh, and. Uh, this is the same mural painted by Judith Hernandez, uh, being restored uh, 10 years later. Uh, and uh, a number of youth were actually harassed again during the restoration of the project. Uh, I didn't have space to include that anecdote in, uh, in the um, show. Uh, and I will conclude uh, with a sample of uh, a video installation I created in, in Conjunction with, in collaboration with uh, an artist, uh, Joe Santramana. So also, one thing I tried to do within the show was to find ways uh, uh, in, in which to activate the archival material, in which to uh, make it come alive. Uh, this is Tomoe, and I'll show you a sample of her uh, video portrait. And I'll end there. I also acknowledge that muralism is still very much alive. I invited uh, young artists, uh, contemporary artists who are painting murals uh, in Los Angeles to participate in these action portraits. Um, so they painted themselves green and uh, we created this collage sampling details from different murals. Uh, for each portrait, I curated a different theme uh, into each portrait in Tamoy. Tomoy, uh, young Guatemala, who grew up in South LA, her name stands for Trapped in My Own Imagination, that's her street name. Um, these are all samples of, of uh, murals that have used the, that super graphic style. Okay, so with that, I'll end. Thank you.